Well, good morning, church. Hallelujah. And I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do you agree with that this morning? Do you agree with that this morning? Amen. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together. Thanks, Lord, for your presence in this place. Lord, we bless you this morning. Hallelujah. Are you blessed this morning? Has God given you blessings? Do you have food in your fridge? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have clothes on your back? You are richer than a lot of people in this world. So thanks, Lord. Let's count our blessings this morning.
every blessing. Let it go and trust you when I cannot see. As I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing, shining every season, you are good to me. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, oh God. Give him a clap offering this morning, church. Thank him for the goodness in your life, for the blessings that he has poured out without measure. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are our cornerstone, oh God, that, Lord, we build our foundations on you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. Shall come with trumpet sound. We look 
sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive.
is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy.
Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Lord, we praise you today. We're thankful that we can be in your house, Lord. We thank you that we can gather together and be a family, Lord. And Lord, as we look to your word today, as we take time to hear from you, Lord, may our hearts be changed. May our, may our attitudes be corrected. May who we are be more like you. And Father, we thank you today. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. Speak to our hearts today. Stir us, O oh God. We give you honor, glory, and praise for you are worthy. As they, they cry out in heaven, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' name. Well, it's good to worship the Lord together, isn't it? And, uh, you know, we uh, are living in interesting times, to say the least. And uh, it's always good to be uh, ready to recognize that God still is in control. God still has your life in control. He knows who you are. He knows about you, so it's good. Uh, we're going to ask that the children make their way downstairs with Pastor Margie and Pastor Bob and uh, Steve. Pastor Steve, can you bring me one of those Advent calendars? Thanks. So um, as we move into the Christmas season, uh, it's doesn't look like it's Christmas yet here, but it will. It's coming. Uh, and uh, we are hoping to uh, next week start our Christmas series called Rediscover. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Called Rediscovering Christmas. And um, Pastor Steve and I are actually uh, going to do a little bit of tag team preaching uh, or teaching, so that'll be fun. Uh, it's something we haven't done in all the time we've known each other. I don't think we've actually done that. So uh, we're going to have fun with that. Um, part of that um, is we, we put together these books. Um, this is just a, a daily reading for 30 days. And it starts on, I want to say Wednesday of this week. Um, and it's through the Advent s season. And um, it'll line up with what we're preaching on Sundays for the next four weeks. So uh, at the end of the service, somebody will be at the door to um, hand those to you if you would want one. Um, uh, we encourage you, if you, if you uh, would like one, to take one. It would be great to have us as a church uh, looking at the same thing every day for, for 30 days. Wouldn't that be great just to know that somebody else is, not, is reading what you're reading? And it would just be a great opportunity for us as a church um, Pastor Bob also has done up an Advent calendar, and it's uh, 25 days of things you can do with your kids uh, during the Advent season. And so um, just encourage you, uh, they'll be available to you at the end of the service, at the door, on your way out. Um, that said, uh, a couple things that I just want to remind you uh, we really need to, to continue to be faithful to abide by the protocols. Um, I know social distancing is a challenge and wearing a mask is a challenge and fellowshipping is a challenge because we want to do those things, but it's really important that we continue to be faithful because here's the thing. If we're not faithful and one person gets sick, they'll shut us down. They're already starting to do that in Toronto and Peel, Manitoba, all of the churches are closed. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that to happen. No. I don't. I'm thankful that we're here together. Um, I know it's hard when we're together not to want to socialize and fellowship with each other. Uh, but I encourage you, please try not to do that. Uh, it's, it's really important that we try to abide by those things. Um, it just would be easier if all this was gone, but it's not. So until it is, until things change, 
We just got to live in the world we're living in, and it's not fun some days. And some days we just kind of go, really? But we'll get through it. Hey, uh, four or five months ago, six months ago, how long ago was March now? Do you remember in March? We had to shut down and not even have church. We had to go online for everything, and, and it was some of us were zoomed out within the first few weeks. And, and you know, so I'm thankful that we're together. I'm thankful that we can be together. So let's just continue to be as faithful as we can to uh, abide by the challenges that we're faced with. Well, that brings us to our last part of this series that we've been kind of um, going through. Uh, we talked about thankfulness and patience, and we talked about compassion and kindness and humility that we're to clothe ourselves with these things. So the last one is this, gentleness. Now, I know in the scripture, gentleness is not the last one. Patience was, or patience is. But um, I did patience with thanks, thanks, Thanksgiving, so just you'll have to deal with the fact that they're out of order. Is that okay? All right. Just want to make sure. So the passage that we've been reading is, is found in Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now we've talked about uh, what that is, to clothe ourselves with, with these things. So today, um, you know, we're talking about gentleness. And, and you'll notice that some of the... All of these things that are mentioned in Colossians 3 are also found in Galatians. In, in Galatians 5, 22, 23, it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. How many know that the fruit of the Spirit are very difficult to have in your life? I, I, I mean, we're talking about gentleness today. I, I want you to think about that. Are we gentle? Are we gentle? Are we gentle with people? Are we gentle with our spouses, our children, our, our brothers, our sisters, our, our friends? Are we gentle with those we don't like? Are we gentle with, with other people in the family of God? Are we gentle? I mean, this is like, it sounds so simple. Oh yeah, I'm gentle. But when you think about it, and you actually think about yourself, are you gentle? It's, it's not something that comes naturally. Now, there are some people who are just naturally gentle. Uh, they're, just, they're just that way. But most people aren't. Most people, um, they're not always gentle. Matter of fact, sometimes we're actually quite harsh with each other. Have you ever had somebody say something to you, and you just kind of walked away thinking, like, are they mad at me? They weren't. It just came across that way right? Or, or have you ever said something or done something that was not very kind or gentle? You see, it is a part of the Spirit. It, it's part of walking in the Spirit and staying in step with the Spirit. It goes on in, in um, Philippians 4, 5, and 6. Listen to what it says. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. So if, if I was to go and do a survey of the people that are around you and ask them about you, would they say that gentleness is evident in you? I mean, think about it. I know for me, there are times I'm not very gentle. I know that. I know who I am. So I, I know there are times when gentleness is not something that is there. I try to be, but you know what? It's not always the case. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with, the thanks, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. God wants to help you be gentle. That's why it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. 
It's a spiritual thing to be gentle. It's not, it's not a natural thing, and it's not a human thing. It is a God thing to be gentle. 1 Peter 3.15 3, says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience that, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ be, may be ashamed of their slander. You know, over the years, I, I've met lots of people. I, you know, in the churches I've been in, I, I, I served in Ajax for, 20, for 10 years. I went to the church for 20. I met a lot of people in 20 years in Ajax. Um, in the four years we were in Edmonton, we were at a big church of, of about 800 and um, met a lot of people there. And, and in Gravenhurst, we were there for 10 years, and, and so we, we met people there and, and now here. And over those course, in the course of those 20 plus years of ministry, I've met some people who are incredibly gentle. And I've also met some people who are incredibly harsh. Have you ever met somebody in church and thought, do they even know Jesus? I've met people like that. They've served Jesus for 30 years or 40 or 50 years, and yet they're still as harsh as they were the day they got saved. There was a lady in, in Edmonton, uh, God rest her soul, she's, she's passed on and gone on to be with the Lord, but we were having this big event. It was a big event. We were having this, this um, Southern Gospel concert, and there were all these groups that were coming to sing, and it was a fundraiser for this min ministry in Edmonton. And every year they would put this, this, this concert on with all these Southern Gospel groups, and the church would be filled to the maximum. Like, the church seated about 1,200, and we would have probably 1,300. It was, it was just crazy. And there was this one lady who attended the church. She had been attending the church for probably 60 or 70 years. She was up in her 80s at the time. And she came into the church that night. First of all, the, the service started at like 6 o'clock. She showed up at like 2 minutes to 6. At 2 minutes to 6, the sanctuary is already full. The parking lot's full. And she pulled up and parked in the fire lane. And I was outside with teenagers helping park because the parking lot was full. And so I said to her, I said, you know, sister, uh, uh, do you want me to park your car for you? No. I said, I, I don't mind. I can go park your car for you and bring it back to you after the service. I mean, I'm one of the pastors. I'm not, I'm not asking the kids to do it. And she was like, I'm parking here. I said, well, you can't park here. It's a fire lane. If you park here, your car will get towed. Like, you can't park here. She just walked past me and went into the church. And I was like, really? And I'm thinking, okay, let's call the bylaw office. I didn't. So her car sat in the fire lane in a place where it wasn't supposed to be throughout the entire thing, and she came out and got in her car and drove off. The very next year, same event. She showed up. Two minutes to six. And where did she decide to park? Oh no, it wasn't going to be in the fire lane. She parked across the door, the, the front walkway of the church. And I said to her, you can't park there. And she said, I can park wherever I want. I've been at this church longer than you've been alive. Who are you to tell me? I said, well, when you come out and your car's gone, um, I'll give you the number to the towing company. And she said, you do that? I said, yeah, I would. Because you're violating the law and you're making it very hard for other people to get in. So why don't you give me the keys to your car and I'll go park your car. Well, she was mad. Who are you to treat me like this? Do you know that I paid for this church to be here? Well, that's nice. Glad you did. Glad you're faithful to the Lord, but you can't park there. Now, we ended up 
coming to an agreement. I moved her car. I parked it where it should be parked. And after the service, I went and got her car and helped her to her car. And I said, wasn't that a lot better? She got in her car and drove off. This is a lady who is bitter and angry and, and wants her way, and she doesn't think anything about it. And I'm thinking, where's the fruit of the Spirit in that? There's, not, there's no fruit in that. It is, it is literally selfish of, of her. Yes, she was old, and yes, she, she, she wanted to park close to the door. But when you show up at two minutes to six, and you know the place is already full, you're not going to get a spot by the door. And, and I said to her, I said, I'm more than willing to, to do this for you. You can imagine a bunch of teenagers. Like, if she's not listening to me, she's not listening to teenagers. The next year she comes, the parking lot is so full, we actually had to close the parking lot when she got there, before she got there. And she pulled up and almost ran over the barricade that we had put across the driveway. And the teenagers are like, like what? you can't come in. There's nowhere to park. She got all mad. She just kept moving her car forward. <laughs> so the boys moved the barricade. She pulled up in the front. and The boys came and told me, and I had to deal with her. And I thought, what a sad commentary on somebody who served the Lord all those years, and yet she has no care for other people or, or concern. And, and you know what, folks? We are to be gentle. Um, we're to be gentle people. And like I said, I've met lots who are, but I've met lots who aren't. And, and really, where is our heart in all of that? Where are we, are we gentle? So I thought, well, what, what does it mean? Now, now it's interesting because the dictionary's definition of gentleness is not the same as what God's definition is. The dictionary's definition of gentle is this. The quality or state of being gentle, mildness or manners, mildness of manners or disposition. Uh, gentle means to f- be free from harshness, sternness, or violence. Tackable, docile, soft, delicate, and moderate. Um, now, folks, um, do you know that you can have a horse that's gentle? It doesn't mean that the horse is, a, is, is timid. It just means that he listens. A horse that's gentle will actually do what its, its owner wants it to do. It, it will be gentle enough that it won't, it won't have it, try to have its own will. So, so when you break a horse, they actually say that when a horse is broken, they're actually gentling it. That's another term they use for breaking a horse. And the idea is that the horse becomes in tune with its master, that it listens, that it, it, it's, it's responsive. And so it becomes gentle. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't, you know, force its own will on the rider. The rider is able to control it. And so when we think of gentleness, it's about allowing the Holy Spirit, allowing God to have authority in our life. Are we going to listen to the Holy Spirit? Or are we going to allow ourselves to rule? And and so this idea of gentleness is not something that comes quickly or easily. This passage in Romans says we are to clothe ourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Um, the idea there is that if we're to be like Christ, to clothe ourselves with Christ's presence, with, with the Holy Spirit, with, with the presence of God, to actually not want to indulge in evil desires. How many know that it's very easy to want to do something that's wrong? Has anyone felt like this week you have wanted to do something that you knew was wrong, but you just wanted to do it? It's okay if you say yes, because I've been there. But here's the thing. If we clothe ourselves in Jesus, clothe ourselves, we will be able to resist. It's interesting because this passage here says, says, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put, put on Christ like putting on new clothes. 
When you came to Christ, did you, did you allow Christ to actually change your life? Did you allow yourselves to exhibit the, the characteristics of Christ? That's what, that's what all this, these last four weeks or five weeks have been about, is about the idea of clothing ourselves with the likeness of Christ, with the, the attitudes and the, and the traits and the character of Christ. Many of us will struggle with that because, honestly, we want to be what we want to be. We want to be... Do our thing, whatever that thing is. If we're willing to clothe ourselves with, with, with gentleness and kindness and compassion and patience and humility and clothe ourselves with Christ, we end up being someone who will exhibit the cult and, and cultivate the character of God in our lives. I don't know about you, but the scripture says that we're to be like Christ. Are we cultivating the characters of Christ in our life? Are we actually wanting to see those things come out of us? You know, we, we, we talk about being like Christ, but sometimes I don't know if we really understand who Christ was. Christ was gentle. The only people we see Christ not gentle with is the religious fanatics of the day. He's not gentle with them. But everyone else, he's incredibly gentle. Even his character is gentle. Look at what he says, what it says in Philippians. It says, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. His desire was to come in gentleness to mankind. I mean, think about it. He's in heaven. He could have come down as a warring king, right? He could have set up a kingdom without any problem. He could have set up a throne and made everyone bow to him and deal with everyone on the planet at the same time at that time when he came. He could have done that. But he chooses not to. He comes as a servant. He comes as a baby, helpless, gentle. He comes as a gentle child. When wise men went looking for a king born of royalty, they instead find a a baby born to a peasant girl, wrapped in cloth and laying in a manger. When we look for Jesus to take the world by storm, To win over those with power, influence, and prestige, we find him instead speaking gently to the weak and the outcasts. When we look for him to to make his move by entering the royal city on a big white horse and, and ready for battle, instead he comes riding on a gentle donkey, lowly on a gentle donkey. You see, Jesus didn't operate in the same way we operate. When the, ga- when the disciples gathered in the upper room, they expected him to give his plan on how he was going to set up his kingdom, and instead he takes a towel, wraps it around him, and washes their feet. He was gentle with everyone he dealt with. When Jesus is arrested and taken before the authorities, everyone looked for him to be straight up declaring that he was God's anointed one, and instead he doesn't even respond. He, d- he stays silent to all of them. Matthew 27, 14 says, But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the, government, of the governor. You remember, Pontius Pilate and Herod both asked Jesus who he said he was. Pilate wanted to let him go. Pilate didn't even want to hurt him. Pilate was kind of like, can you just tell me? Just say you're not, and, and we, can get, we can stop this whole thing. And Jesus said nothing. Nothing. When the Apostle John in Revelation 5, 6 tells us about the, the one that is able to open the scrolls, He's looking for the lion to open the scrolls and its seven seals. And what does he find? Instead, a gentle lamb looking as if it had been slaughtered. Jesus portrays himself and he has this image of gentleness that many of us have a hard time to even grasp, never mind be. 
Listen to Jesus himself on how he describes himself. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My kids will tell you that I'm not always gentle. My wife will tell you I'm not always gentle. Sometimes I'm miserable. Sometimes I'm grumpy. Sometimes I'm not always friendly. Sometimes I'm not the person that I should be. But I'm called to be gentle. I'm called to be like Christ. I'm called to manifest the characters of Christ in my life. And it doesn't always come easy. You see, it was the gentleness of Jesus that attracted the sinner. He wasn't attractive. The sinners weren't attracted to Jesus because he set up a, a, thorn, a, 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 a throne. Thank you. That's just. Psh. He wasn't attractive to them because he was abrasive. He wasn't attractive to them because he knew everything. He wasn't attractive because he came to change everything with the Romans, he was attractive because he was gentle with the sinner who was broken and hurting. You know, think about this. The woman at the well, he wasn't mean to her. He was forthright with her. He did tell her that, you know, she did have more than one husband, but he was gentle with her. He had all the reason in the world not to be. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He had all the reason in the world to just tell her, give me a drink, and, and not, but no, he was gentle with her. How about Zacchaeus in the tree? Tax collector that everyone hated. What's he do? He goes up and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to go to your house. Come on, let's, let's go to your house. There is a gentleness about Jesus that we sometimes miss in Scripture how about when he healed the lepers or, or the woman caught in adultery or the blind beggar or the tax collectors? Over and over in Scripture, we see Jesus exhibiting gentleness with people who are lost and hurting. The only one that we don't see him with gentleness is the religious leaders of the day. Now, I already read this in Philippians uh, 4 or 5. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Paul goes on in, in, to Timothy, he says to Timothy, he says, but you, man of God, flee from all, the, all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. To pursue, to chase after until you find it. You know, it's that idea that you're, you're running after, you're chasing after, pursue it. Many young men have pursued young ladies. Probably not always for the right reasons. Let me rephrase that. Most of the time, not for the right reasons. But, but there's a pursuing, there's this there's desire to, to, to catch the eye of that young lady or, the, or, or to con connect with her. And there's a pursuing and a chasing until you, you get it. And that's what, what Paul is saying to Timothy. He says, pursue, pursue, chase after, chase after these things. Pursue them until you find them, that you might be the man or woman of God that he's called you to be. And he's saying to Timothy, come on, don't, you know, flee from all that stuff that you were doing and chase after these things. How do we do that? How do we show gentleness to people? Well, first and foremost, if you want to find gentleness in your life, start praying for people you don't like. And I don't mean praying prayers that say, God, deal with them. I, say, I mean prayers that say, God, bless them. God, pour into their life. God, God you, know, you know, bless them for who they are. God, bless them for who they're not. Bless them. Just bless them. You start praying for people who treat you badly, that kind of prayer, God will soften your heart and allow you to be gentle. 
Because you cannot pray that way without the Holy Spirit coming into your life. Because if somebody treats you badly, you're not going to want to pray godly things about them. I mean, our human nature wants to pray, God, deal with them. God, fix that problem because they're so messed up. And God says, no, no, no. God, forgive me for being so harsh. God, help me to love them. God, change my heart so that I can show the attitude of gentleness and love and compassion towards them. That doesn't change the fact that they maybe did something wrong. But it will change you. You see, sometimes we, we, we get to this idea that, that, well, they owe us or they, you know, I, I'm always amazed at, at this issue of forgiveness. Our world sees forgiveness as letting the person off for what they did. You know what God sees forgiveness as? Unchaining yourself from them so that you don't have to live in that pain anymore. The problem is when we don't forgive, we hang on, and then we're always reminded every time we see them, every time we think about them, every time something happens, we're brought back to that situation that we chained ourselves to because of unforgiveness. Forgiveness is a release for us. It's not letting them off. It's letting us out of the situation so that we can be released and, and, and live a life of gentleness and peace with God. God has forgiven you for who you are, right? God forgave you. He actually unchained himself from the sinner and allowed you to actually be joined to him in a way that's healthy and brings life through his son. We've been grafted into the vine, not chained to the vine. So if we want to really cultivate gentleness in our life, we need to start praying for those who have been horrible to us, to, to show compassion and kindness and humility and allow it to start flowing in our lives. Gentleness will come out of learning to pray for those who have mistreated us. For that matter, praying for those who have treated us well will help us to show gentleness as well. Giving grace to people giving grace to people. Have you ever met someone that has no rough edges? Have you ever met anyone who has no rough edges? They have nothing that bothers you. I bet you everyone bothers you in some way, right? We all have rough edges. We all have things that are prickly. You know, there's a, a lady in Gravenhurst, we, we loved her to death, and she would say to us, she says, I'm just being a little prickly today. So, I, I'm not very kind today, I'm being a little prickly, forgive me. We all have it, that we've never met, I, I don't know anyone I've met who doesn't have some kind of rough edge. Now, some people have more rough edges than others, and they rub us the wrong way, but but the truth is that we all have rough edges and we need to show grace to each other. Grace to each other. If we want to show the gentleness of Christ, then we need to be gracious. And it's interesting because gentleness in, in, in Scripture is always, it's always placed in opposition to words as harsh, violent, unrelentant, strict, severe, so a person who is gentle is a person who gives grace to others in the midst of nonsense. In the last nine months, is there anyone in the room who has not spoken badly of somebody in authority for some reason or other because of COVID-19? You haven't? <laughs> I'm impressed. No. Honestly, right? We've all had something to say. We've all said something. We've all, we've all probably not all been gentle all the time since COVID-19 happened. Matter of fact, most of us probably have had some things we said and we wished we hadn't and we kind of go, well, I guess it wasn't very godly that day. And maybe you're not like me. I, I know I have. I've, I've struggled with it. There's been times I've said things and I was like, really? Like, God help me. Because that's the only one that can. 
You see, gentleness comes out of showing grace. Ephesians 4.2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The idea is that we're to bear in one another with love. So I just want to remind you that no one's perfect, except God. So I can guarantee your spouse will disappoint you. Your kids will fail you. Your friends will let you down. Your church will drop the ball at times, and your pastor won't meet your expectations. And if you expect all of those to not happen, you're in trouble. Because as your pastor, I will fail you at some point. I will not meet up to the expectations you have Guaranteed. I'm sure that if you're married, your spouse has probably disappointed you more than once if you've been married for any length of time. And it doesn't matter how wonderful you are and how wonderful your spouse is. I guarantee at some point you have disappointed each other. And the longer you're married, the more chance of disappointment is. That doesn't mean that they're horrible. It just means they're human just like you. So if your spouse is disappointing you, chances are you've disappointed your spouse. No, not, chances, chances are, are not even there. You have disappointed. If your spouse has disappointed you, you probably disappointed them. Guaranteed. You've, you've probably failed your children at some point, And your children are, are going to fail you at some point. Josh and I joke about the fact that he realizes I actually know things now. We joke about it. He realizes that I'm not, you know, I'm not just a parent who doesn't know anything. I actually do know some things, and I, you know. But there was a point during his teenage years where it didn't matter what I said, I was wrong. And it wasn't because he's a bad son. He's just a human, right? I mean, we've all been there. We probably didn't think our parents knew what they were talking about. Maybe we still don't. And there are times when we have legitimate gripes. There are times when, when we're right because we've been wronged, but that does not mean that we have the right to be harsh. It's an opportunity. It's the crossroad of gentleness. It's the place where the path will take us. We can choose to be condemning and cold shoulder, or we choose to show grace and gentleness. And honestly, we live in a world that is condemning and, and, and cold shoulders are everywhere. Part of the reason there's so much brokenness in our society is people don't know how to forgive, and, and, and we just live in this constant recycling of the, of the past, and we keep going back to the problem that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. I have friends who are still living in that brokenness of their, of their teenage years and, and can't get past it. And so, so they're always blaming someone else and gone to, the, gone to drinking and, and, and doing drugs just to justify the pain that they're in because they don't want to forgive or let go or accept the fact that they messed up. You see, God can use us to, to mend broken people because we are broken ourselves. And God wants to show gentleness through the brokenness of our lives. Not, not because we're not broken. God wants to show gentleness in the brokenness that we are gentle with each other. Paul says to the church in Galatians, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by, sin, by some sin, you are you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. It doesn't say you beat them over the head because they're a sinner. It says you gently and humbly help them back. A lot of times we're able to point the finger, but we're not able to hold out our hand. Paul gives a stern warning that be careful that you don't fall into the same temptation yourself. 
He goes on to 2 Timothy, he says this, he says, Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to them to the knowledge of truth. He was talking to Timothy about, about dealing with people, and he said, listen, those who opposed him, those who, who opposed Christ, be gentle. Give gentle instruction in the hope that God will grant them repentance. I've yet to meet somebody who repented because people were harsh with them. Why did Zacchaeus come to know the Lord? Because Jesus was gentle with him. Why did the woman at the well tell the truth and, and come to repentance? Because Jesus was gentle with her. Are we going to come to the truth because we're gentle or are we going to be harsh with one another? And, and gentleness starts with our mouth. You know what? A lot, of, a lot of our problems starts with our mouth, right? It does. Obesity starts with the mouth. Well, it starts with the eyes, but eventually it's, it ends up with the mouth, right? Why? Why? Because we crave things, so we just keep putting it in. One of the biggest challenges we have with each other is we speak sometimes and say things that hurt before we think. Has anyone ever done that? You, you, you said something and then thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that? Am I the only one? Like, really, right? We, we say things sometimes that, that's painful or hurt, hurtful or, or condemning or we need to learn to, to speak. I love this passage. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others by according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That verse is really hard to do without Jesus. That verse is really hard to walk out without the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, how do you do that? How do you, who, how do you keep your mouth from speaking Things that are unwholesome. Think about it, folks. Think about your last week. Has there been a day when you've said something that was not correct, that was not beneficial to building others up? We're all aware how easy it is to spread this virus with our mouths. That's why everyone in the world is wearing a mask, or should be. And yet, many of us need to put a mask on, not because of a virus, but because of the things we say. You know, the, the mask might stop the virus from coming out of your mouth onto somebody else, and it may stop you from getting it from somebody else. But... It doesn't stop you from saying things you shouldn't say. We need to be aware of what's coming out of our mouths. Let's be people that practice the promises of Proverbs. Look at what it says in Proverbs. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Are we gentle? Proverbs 15.4 says that the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. Do you want to be people of life? Then let your tongue be, a, be a, a, an instrument used to bring life to people. goes on to say, tell us, of that, tell us that a gentle word is stronger than you might think. Though through patience a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Now, I, I'm not quite sure I understand that verse. But, but you know that saying, sticks and stones, but words will never hurt me? It's not true, folks. Words can hurt us more than sticks and stones. Because see, sticks and stones may hurt you physically, and, but you'll heal from that. But a lot of times, the words that are said to us sometimes are more damaging than any stick or stone could ever be. Because they stick in us forever until God comes and heals us of it. So we need to be careful on what we say. 
Ephesians 6.4 challenges us not to aspirate our children, but to bring them up in the training and the instructions of the Lord. <laughs> How many uh, parents have failed at that? <laughs> right? We've all probably failed at some point in that. It's not easy to be a parent. It's not easy to raise your children. It's not easy to have them frustrated with you. How about our spouses? Have you said anything to your wife that that is hurting, that has caused her to see herself less than she is? Or have you said something to your husband that has caused him to to extinguish the flame of God in his life and and doesn't want to serve God or, or wants to serve God but minimally? And is our witness that, that that it causes people to actually want to know Christ? But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, I don't know how many times I've seen people who treat other people with such disrespect and wonder why, they, why that person doesn't want anything to do with God. God did not call us to beat people with the word of God. He called us to show the love of Christ. Just like you know you're a sinner, a sinner knows they're a sinner. Right? We know what is right and wrong. Unless we're literally demonic, everyone knows there is some things that are just wrong, no matter who you think you are. And and we don't need to point out their sin We need to point them to Jesus who loves them. And for too long, the church has pointed their finger at the world and wonders why the world doesn't want to get saved. Because they don't see the love of Christ. They see the religious attitude of the heart of man instead of seeing the heart of the Spirit that says, hey, I want to treat you with gentleness because I want to show you the compassion, the love, the patience that God has with you. Tell me God hasn't been patient with you. I know he's been patient with me. If we would, we would learn to be able to express the hope we have with gentleness and respect. I was talking to a church at one time, and they, uh, their, their church sits across the street from a mosque. And it's in an area where it's hard to find parking spots. No matter what time of the day it is, no matter what day of the week it is, it's hard to find parking spots. Church has a big parking lot. Their church is fenced in with steel fence around the entire church parking lot with a big gate, and it's locked all the time. It's only open on Sundays when there's church or when they're having a meeting. So I asked them, I said, what are you doing to minister to the mosque across the street? They looked at me and they said, what do you mean? Well, what are you doing? Like, are you reaching out to them? Like, are you showing love of Jesus to them? Like, I said, what's with the fence around the parking lot? Oh, we did that because the people at the mosque were parking in our parking on Saturday. I said, let me ask you a question. Were you using the parking lot on Saturday? Uh, no. So what's the big deal that they're using your parking lot? Didn't Jesus tell us to bless those who love us? Or bless those who persecute us? Didn't Jesus say to show kindness to those who are not of the faith? Didn't Jesus, like, like where, do you, where do we draw the line on, on God's grace and his mercy? Oh, because they're using your parking lot? I, like, I, like, why don't you take a key over to the, the imam and, and let him have a key to the, to the parking lot so that his people can park there on Saturdays and show the love of Christ, and maybe you might have a dialogue with him and eventually see him come to Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's crazy. Why would we do that? They're Muslims. Folks, we need to stop thinking this mentality that that we're God's gift to the world when we act like we're not. 
If we're going to be God's gift to the world, we need to show the compassion and kindness and gentleness and love that Jesus Christ showed. <sighs> Sorry. It just, it, it just amazes me sometimes what comes out of our mouths as Christians. We talk about Jesus being loving, and yet we don't show his love to people who need him. So therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, and patience. And you know, this is not just as individuals. You notice it says God's chosen people? All of us, together, we're all in this together. You know what, some days maybe you can't show kindness, but your brother or sister can. And you can walk together showing the kindness of Christ. Clothe yourselves, all of you, not just one, not just an individual. Together as a corporate body, can we be a church that shows love and compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience? Can you imagine if, if, if our church, anyone that walked in felt they saw the traits of, of Jesus like that and they were actually attracted to what God is doing because we actually are showing the love of God? The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, par- par- patience. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Folks, um, I want you to take a look at this, this, this passage. Do you notice it does not say, but the fruits of the Spirit? The fruit. Singular. Though there are many points to that, it is singular. The fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's not like you can pick and choose which ones you want. It's singular. All of these are the traits of the Spirit of God. These are the things that should be produced in our life. Love, joy, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We live in a time when the church where many profess Christ they're more interested in the gifts of the Spirit than actually having the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. And folks, the gifts of the Spirit are freely given to the body. But they are not a measure of your spirituality. God does not measure your spirituality by the gifts that are in your life. He measures the spirituality of you when you exhibit the characteristics of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit are evident in you. Now here's the thing. Do I believe the gifts of the Spirit should be operational in church? Absolutely. But here's the thing. If we don't have the fruit of the Spirit, we will operate in the gift out of our flesh instead of the the Holy Spirit, which wants to operate in these things. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and love, joy, peace, and forbearance. If we would operate in the, in the, if we would have the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives, when we operate in the gifts, they would come with the benefit of, of actually ministering in the character of Christ. You know what happens most times with the gifts? We operate in the character of who we are. We do. The gifts of the Spirit sometimes are not, it's not that something is wrong. I've I've seen people who have have given a prophecy, and the prophecy is 100% correct but delivered with such harshness that it is, it is, it is, it's offensive. Was the person right in what they said? Absolutely. Were they wrong in how they delivered it? Absolutely. And folks, if we would allow the fruit of the Spirit to come out of us, guess what? We would not operate in the gifts 
incorrectly, we would operate out of the love of Christ. So if, if there's anything that we as a church should desire, it should be to have the fruit in our lives because then the gifts would operate with love and compassion and kindness. So, would you agree with me to let's work at walking in the Spirit together? To actually show these, these, these clothe ourselves with these traits of the Holy Spirit? Would, would, you, would you agree that this year, you know, we've had a crazy year and, and we're going to go into another year with, with, with similar situation until such time as it changes and who knows when that'll be. But can we be people who show compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience? And not just with those who are lost, but with each other. I mean, in the last nine months, have, have you not showing those things to people that are in the body? You see, it's interesting because all of them are tied to this one word. If we love one another, right? The scripture says, they will know you're my disciples if you Love one another. Will we be compassionate with one another? Will we show kindness to one another? Will we, will we be humble enough to accept the fact that, that, I, that you don't know everything? Will, you know, will we be gentle with one another that we won't actually be harsh or, or inconsiderate? One of the challenges with COVID-19 has been that, that everyone has an opinion about what's going on. Everybody has an opinion on how they feel about it. And, and really, we need to respect one another enough to recognize that we all feel differently about it. Right? I mean, sometimes we, you know, we all have different opinions about it. I mean, I know some for me, I mean, there have been times where I'm like, I'm done, right? But there are other people who are still afraid, who are, are struggling with it, or, or there's people who really need to protect themselves. And, and it comes out of love and compassion to, to show that kind of grace to respect one another's opinion and, and to actually care. Jesus was attractive to the lost because he actually showed those things. He showed the love of God. So would you stand with me this morning? And we're going to pray. We're going to pray for these shoe boxes. Just raise your hands up. This is an act of love. It's an act of love. It's an act of kindness. It's, a, it's, it's showing compassion. People from our community have brought shoe boxes. You uh, from our congregation have brought shoe boxes. Other church have brought shoe boxes. People have shown up with shoe boxes. There's just over a hundred boxes here. And I'm sure tomorrow morning we'll have a few more. But let's be people that show the love of Christ. Would you extend your hands to this? We're just going to pray over these boxes. And believe God that they will touch people's lives. And change their lives. A simple act of care. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for every person that has fill the box. We thank you, Lord, for every person that, that took the time to go to the store and purchase some things and actually put them in and, and be thoughtful about it and want to express the love of Christ to, to a child in this world. 
And so, Father, today as these boxes are getting ready to go to the distribution center and eventually get distributed around the world, Lord, we pray that you would touch every child that gets one of these boxes. Lord, we know there are boxes in other churches and other locations, and there's boxes and boxes upon boxes, and they're going to be given out around the world. And, and Lord, they are heal the message of the gospel of you. But Lord, we just ask that you, Lord, we thank you that you've given us the resources to be able to do this. But Lord, more importantly, we pray that these children whose lives they touch would encounter you. May it be a blessing to them. May it meet some of their need. May it, may it bring joy to their heart. May it put a smile on their face. And may they encounter the love of Christ because of it. May they come to the knowledge of Christ because of it. Lord, you know. You know where every one of these boxes will go. You know the kid already that is going to receive that box. And so, Lord, we pray right now that you would just right now stir their heart, that their heart would be softened to the message of Christ, that their heart would be softened by the love and compassion that others have shown them. Father, we can't go all around the world and meet all these kids, but Lord, we can reach them through these boxes. So Lord, we pray that you'd bless them. Lord, we pray for the, the, the Samaritan's Purse and the, and, the, and the distribution center and Lord, all of the work that has to still happen before these even get to a child. Lord, we pray for all those workers who volunteer to serve and, and to sort and to, to pack up and to get to, the, to the, the countries that they need to go to. And Lord, all the people who, who touch those boxes and, and distribute them uh, to, around the globe to these children. Lord, we pray that you'd bless each and every one of them as they do that, that volunteer and service to show the love of Christ. And Lord, may every child in this year of craziness be touched at Christmas in a way that will change their lives forever. Father, I pray for us as a church family that we would become people of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. That, Lord, you would use us in this community to show the love of Christ. Father, we pray for the other churches in town that you would bless them, that you would pour out your spirit on them. That, Lord, that they would, they would show the love of Christ as well. That, Lord, together as the body of Christ in Sioux Lookout, there would be a, a, a presence of your spirit and your love in this community. And Lord, we pray that you would just go with us from this place, that you would keep us as, as you have in the past, Lord, that you would continue to walk with us and change us, that we might be clothed with the characters of Christ and your Holy Spirit. May the fruit of the Spirit be evident in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.